Good morning, Ponca City. That's the best Ponca City can do? Come on, come on. Good morning. Good morning. There you go, there we go. It's great to be here. I've never been here before. I've been several places in Oklahoma, but not in this part of your state. Same for Tammy. Tammy's joining me today. She's one of our, as Terry said, one of our Disrupting Poverty Cadre members through ASCD. How many here, let me just see a show of hands, have ever heard of ASCD? Okay, a few of you have. So ASCD is the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development. It's a publisher and a professional developer development organization. It's the largest one in the United States has about 185,000 members, and we both work with them. We're both at universities, but we work with them as well as, as write for them and publish books and so on. You'll hear about that stuff today. So why are we here today? As Terry said, we're here to talk about poverty. Who knows what the percentage of kids in your district is, the percentage of kids that qualify for free and reduced meals? Anybody know that? What is that number? Uh, it's a bit over half. Okay, over half. I heard. I heard 79. We do this like an auction. Anybody above that? 84. Okay. Well, according to according to your data that's reported on your website to the state. You have about 68% of your kids that qualify for free and reduced meals. And we're going to talk about what that means in a minute in terms of the qualification and so on. So 68%. Now we know that that number, wherever we go, and we're making a presentation like this somewhere about every week in the United States, and we say the same thing. Whatever that number is, that's your floor. That's the number down here because kids have to apply. Kids and families have to apply. We know some don't. We also know that if you're just over the income qualification level, which we'll talk about in a minute, by one dollar, you don't qualify. So we got a lot of kids that live near poverty, real close to poverty, and you guys would certainly, a lot of your kids and students in this district would be in that category as well. So 68% is your floor. We, use, we usually round that up by at least 10% to say you may, you may have 75 near 80 near some of those numbers you hear. And if you go building by building, you probably do have some that are higher given the, the attendance zones that, that attend those schools. So poverty. Let's start, we want to start by asking you to watch a video. And we're going to have you think about this when you watch it. Think about your role. Think about your kids. There are a lot of kids in this video. Or could these kids be kids that live in Ponca City? Is, does anything kind of ring true for you? Let's watch this video and then we'll talk about it for a minute. And Jennifer is activating our videos. There was one by the river in a little tent, and oh, just like that river, I've been running ever since. What was supposed to be our room had like a dead lizard skeleton in there, and we would sleep on the floor. You know, there were always like mats around the bananas that we had, and in the backyard, the, the grass was like really high. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. We couldn't afford the house that we were living in before Dad left anymore, so I think the bank took the house, and so we had to move, and then we moved again. I think in the course of four years, four or five years, we lived in like seven different houses or something, something crazy like that. When my dad left, he, we were struggling a lot because my mom is disabled and she can't get a job to help, to pay for the bills, get food. I lost a lot of weight. I, I remember I, I used to be size five and I went from size five to size zero. So, you know, I try to not eat too much. I try to eat in school. There was nights where 
we didn't have anything to put in our stomachs. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. I remember sitting at the gas station, she's putting like 50 cents in the gas tank, and I'm like, I'm like, I see other people, they're putting $20 in. I'm like, why are you doing that, Mom? And I asked her one day, I'm like, why do you put so little in? She's like, I don't have money to get to work. She worked four jobs every day, and she worked like, I hardly saw her at all because she was working so much and she was always tired. And like, it was really difficult to make ends meet. When you're homeless, you, you don't have too much to call your own. So, you know, food is a, when you don't have money, you don't have clothing, you know, food is definitely a, a necessity or a concern. Um, you know, even still to this day, we have uh, you know, troubles with food. The first couple of months at the shelter, uh, I felt like I was losing myself. Um, my grades dwindled, uh, my spirit died. And I didn't really want to do much. You know, when you're kids, you kind of like want all these things. And when you don't have the money, you kind of, you know, you're kind of sad. You're like, I kind of want it, but I can't have it. And it's kind of like chaotic. And it just very, I don't know, didn't make you feel very like secure about anything. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know. Uh, a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. So turn to the person next to you or beside of you or in front of you or somewhere. Could this be, could these remarks of kids be true here? Could this be happening with your kids? What, what, how does this connect with your realities of your kids in Ponca City? Thank you. We'll do a number of these through the day or, or we'll ask you to turn and chat or compare, think about something with somebody near you and I'll, I'll always interrupt you before you're, you finish your thoughts usually and sorry for that, we'll just keep moving. But you know, this is an example of, of an opportunity for you all to think about poverty and the poverty that exists here in your city and in your schools among your kids. You know, when we launch into talking about poverty, you can't do this without talking about achievement. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna present on your achievement levels. Most teachers have intuition that tells them pretty clearly who's, who's doing well and who isn't, but we've also got a lot of data that demonstrates that. And when we look at your district's data, something all districts do today and have for years in this country is disaggregate by various groups. And one of the groups is free and reduced lunch. So when you look at your free and reduced lunch data, meaning the kids that qualify for free and reduced lunch, and compare their achievement to the achievement of the kids that don't qualify, what will you find? Well, almost everywhere we go, including here, you'll see big gaps. The big gaps basically indicate the kids that are qualifying for free and reduced lunch are not scoring as well and doing as well as the kids on average, as the kids that don't qualify. That's a reality. You probably all know that in your classrooms. We always urge groups to, to from, from the work we've done in studying schools that are recognized as high performing high poverty schools. In other words, this would be a school or a district where, for instance, 75, 80, 85 percent of the kids are at proficiency that have poverty rates like yours or higher. Those are the schools we study. And what we find in those schools is the teachers become very familiar with their data. They know which kids aren't where they need to be and they work toward getting those kids where they need to be, you know, to say it in a very simple way. So, in terms of, of what you're going to hear today, you're going to hear a lot of ideas, strategies, conditions, approaches that we've uh, come to understand from spending a lot of time in these high poverty, high performing schools. So let me say a word or two about them. 
Uh, you're also going to see a video in a moment or two to let you not just hear about what these schools do, but this is a, an opportunity where we last year spent quite a bit of time with a film crew in a number of high-performing, high-poverty schools, asking the staff, asking the teachers, the superintendents, the principals, the parents, the kids, what's going on here? How does it, how, how could it be that you guys have 75, 80, 85 percent poverty and you're a high performing school, you've got that many, that number of kids or more at proficiency. What are you doing? And that's the story we'll try to tell today. So you'll, we'll see some videos as well. We have a new book that's coming out in January that focuses on classroom and teacher practice around five critical areas we're going to talk about today and these are areas that we found teachers in high poverty high performing schools become very proficient and effective at and so we're going to share those with you today as well we have several learner outcomes that we hope would be accomplished today one is that will emerge with a substantially enhanced knowledge of what works for underachieving kids that live in poverty. Second outcome is that we hope you will understand how high poverty schools become high performing. What is it that they do? What's that journey look like? And finally, and most importantly, would be that you're prepared to take those first steps, take those next steps. Take the steps from wherever you are toward getting more of your kids to proficiency, particularly those kids that live in poverty. So we'll ask you, often during today and this afternoon, Tammy and I both will in the separate sessions we're doing, we'll ask you to look in a mirror, to hold that mirror up in front of you. Because first, a lot of the things that we will talk about today will validate your practice. You're going to say, yeah, I do that, and that works. And they're doing it in these schools as well. They're implementing this strategy or this technique or, or this system or this approach. You're going to hear a lot of things that validate your practice, which is good. You guys are, are not a severely low-performing district. We go a lot of places where the median level achievement is like 30 or 40 percent of the kids. So you guys are considerably above that in terms of your median levels of achievement. But it doesn't mean you don't have a significant number of kids that, that need that boost to get them up to proficiency. I'm sure you're all aware of that. So a lot of what you're doing is working, but a lot of what we do is also challenge groups, challenge educators, to think about what they're doing, to consider their data, and to say, why can't we do better? Why can't we get more of our kids to proficiency? That's the first step any of these high-performing, high-poverty school educators take, is to look at their own practice, look at their own data, and say, we can do better. What do we need to do to take those next steps? And that's a lot, again, of what we'll talk about. There also, we found in this study, in these studies of schools, is the educators wanted to tell us a lot about things they had to quit doing, stop doing. Kind of surprised us. We thought we'd come out with lists of these are the two do's, now let's figure out how to do them. But almost every case of interviews, as well as time spent observations in schools, we came upon the understanding that that a lot of these educators would want to first point to things they had to stop doing. Stop doing, not start doing. And we'll talk about some of those, some of those areas of practice. You're doing some. It's common practice across the United States. There are, there are traditional kind of long-held beliefs that this is what we need to do in school that really work against the goal of getting all of our kids to proficiency. So we'll, we'll talk about what some of those are. Let me see hand-wise, uh, how many of you are teachers? Pretty much everybody's a teacher. How about how many are elementary teachers? Okay, and secondary, middle, middle school teachers. Okay, and high school teachers. Okay, do we have paraprofessionals here? I think it's all just certified people today, okay? Are there any coaches 
reading coaches, math coaches, instructional coaches. Have any of those couple here? And what about counselors, school counselors? They're all together back over here, okay? And uh, we've got administrators as well, I know. I'm, let's, can we just see where the principals, assistant principals are? Folks are scattered around, okay? So where did this stuff, how did we do this? How did we do what we do? I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna walk you through just a little bit of the actual the way this, these early, this early study was set up, but what we've continued to do. So if you look at a scatter plot like this one, each one of those little blue dots rec represents an elementary school, happens to be in the state of Illinois. On the vertical axis over on this side, on the left side, percent of fifth graders meeting standard in math. So this is only a representation of fifth grade achievement in math across elementary schools in the state of Illinois. Across the bottom, low income students, kids that qualify for free and reduced meals. So anytime you put, a, put one of these together, a scatter plot, you could do it and maybe have right here in your district. You probably find similar, a similar uh, display of data, meaning the achievement levels correspond directly to the number of kids that live in poverty. And we find this descending trend line, which basically means or indicates the more kids in poverty, the lower the achievement. That's that. That's the, what I was mentioning earlier. This trend trend line. You guys are right in here somewhere in terms of your, your number of kids that qualify for free and reduced meals. We looked at these schools. And the schools we're going to share with you and talk about fall into the upper right quadrant here, meaning schools that have 675, 80, 85, 90 percent of their kids qualify for free news meals and are scoring at the 80 percent level and above. Now this happens to be just one area, math. The schools we looked at consistently, math, literacy, sometimes science, sometimes the other areas if they're tested accordingly will fall into this. And we ask the simple question, how'd they do it? How'd they do it? It'd be interesting, I haven't looked at your data, to know, do any of your schools, how do your individual schools look and appear and display on a, on a, a chart like this or a, a display of data? If you just listed your seven, your seven or eight or nine schools. And you'll probably find similar, the schools that have lower numbers of kids that qualify for free news meals are doing a little better. The schools that are in this range are probably doing a little better. Well, that's what, that's what this work is intended to address and hopefully improve on and change. Where do these schools exist? Well, this, this is about 10 or 11 of the schools specifically we spent time in. They're everywhere. Every state has high-performing, high-poverty schools. Often the state departments recognize them. They're there are schools that you can visit, you can often drive to and see. We always encourage, always encourage, if you've got a recognized high-performing, high-poverty school nearby, take a half day, see, see if you can arrange it for a small group to go visit, see what they're doing. We can virtually guarantee you that they will be doing some things in the way of practices and approaches and use of data and so on, probably differently or differently than you're doing or differently than other schools. So these schools are around. What really happens, what really happens in these high performing, high poverty schools is the staff, the educators, you guys, all begin to think in terms of poverty as the lowest common denominator. Meaning if we've got 70% of our kids that live in poverty, we are a high poverty district. We are a high poverty district, and that means we probably need to act and operate a little differently than districts that have far less kids that live in poverty. And these educators tend to teach, and leaders lead, and teachers lead through a lens, meaning they think about poverty in virtually everything they do. They ask that question, how's this, how's this new program, or practice, or approach, or expenditure going to help our kids that live in poverty? They ask those questions, and we'll talk more about questions. So, so rather than me continuing to rattle on up here, or Tammy, 
And Tammy, we haven't even got you up yet, but we'll go into it in a minute. Uh, I want you to watch a video. And this is, this is one of one of the schools we spent time in last year. It's actually uh, a school that's kind of due north and, and east of you in Michigan. It's North Godwin Elementary School. They won or awarded a Dispelling the Myth Award in 2009. So you think, well, that's, that's eight years ago. Yeah, it is. And they actually had done a lot of the work to become a high-performing, high-poverty school the years before 2009. The reason we're continuing to focus on this school is they have sustained their gains. They were a high poverty school, they continue to be. 92% of the kids in this school live in poverty in this particular school. And they have sustained the gains that you're gonna see about. So let's, let's watch this video on North God and then we'll talk about it a little bit. North Cadwin is a diverse urban school um, set just outside the city of Grand Rapids in Michigan. And um, we have great families, great students. Um, our, our families are really committed to the education process and they're very, very supportive of what we do here at the school. And it's a very caring, loving environment and we're all about the community here at North Godwin. And Godwin has a very interesting background in terms that it was once one of the very high echelon schools in the area. Um, they had a GM plant here uh, that made it pretty much very uh, affluent. They were the first district to have an indoor and outdoor pool. Um, after a period of time, things changed. The General Motors stamping plant closed and thousands of people lost their jobs. Refugees from Bosnia and immigrants from across the globe settled in the area. Our district now currently is almost 50% Hispanic, um, so that we've had to learn a lot about different cultures and um, meet the needs of our, our students where they're at. About 40% uh, of our population are English language learners. 92% of the students at North Godwin are from low-income families, but hardship has not stood in the way of achievement. In 2009, the Education Trust recognized North Godwin with the Dispelling the Myth Award. Since that year, Test scores in math and reading have significantly exceeded state averages. And we've had to change our teaching practices over the years and our delivery of instruction in order to meet the needs of all of our students. We need to understand what our teachers need, and in turn our teachers need to understand our students. They need to understand that um, a lot of times their households are not like the households we grew up in, that when we go home and away from our district that they remain here in the district. You have gang activity, um, you have a lot of substance abuse going on, a lot of mental illness that occurs, and all those things are things that our children are not sequestered for until Usually they come within the confines and walls of their own school district and uh, go into that little community, their classroom, where they feel safe, and where a lot of times they receive maybe the only two meals they get each day. We've had to do a lot of work as a staff. We've had to learn about poverty and worked really hard to understand what, what it is um, children are going through in our homes and out in our community. We've had to put in a lot of programs to help our families become more successful and to take away some of those barriers that they meet um, on a daily basis. The data on what school looks like, I mentioned the, the number of kids that qualify for reduced meals. This is what their demographic looks like. So let's look just a moment at some of their of their data. And again, this is this is an area where in any high performing, high poverty school, this is usually you know, prominent when you walk in the school, you, they display their data, they have data rooms, you guys probably have these too, where you actively look at your data, compare it, compare it look, at your, look at your achievements, advances, and so on. So when you look at North Godwin, this is reading, and this happens to be fourth grade. You can see the dark blue, which is the state averages, and you can see their averages. So we look for a couple things here, and what you can obviously see is that, number one, they're doing significantly better than state averages. Number two, you know they've got 92% of their kids that qualify for free and reduced meals. Number three, we see gains every year. They're getting better every year. They aren't just flat doing better than their district, than their state. They're getting better. Well, that's reading. So if we look at math, same thing, their state test, State tests, 
state averages, North Garden Elementary, significantly better. How could that happen? How could they be doing this? They didn't get a $10 million grant dropped on them by, by the Kellogg Foundation or someone. They didn't get reconstituted where they brought in a team of all-stars from somewhere. They're a normal, regular elementary school that as a collective staff decided, we're going to get better. And they went about this journey. Tammy, you wanted to introduce past Christiane? Tammy's from, Tammy's from Northern Alabama, and this district is kind of close to Northern Alabama. Well, my mother would want me to tell you that I live in Alabama, but I'm really from Illinois. I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay, so um, just like Oklahoma, you know you have challenges with weather, you know, like maybe a tornado or two or three <laughs> or four or five. So in the, in the Gulf of Mississippi and in Alabama, we have these wonderful things called hurricanes. And so this high school is gonna share what they did um, be, even before the hurricane came. But imagine losing your entire school because of tragedy. Some of you may can imagine that. And so we're gonna share this video with you, how they did some things differently um, to dispel the myth of working with children in poverty. And we, we probably shouldn't show this without also acknowledging these guys just went through one yesterday. A few days ago, you're aware of, of and maybe feeling of some of the side effects here, but they just went through Hurricane Nate just went right across the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And this middle school and this high school, we haven't talked to them, we will in the days to come, but have just experienced something, nothing like they did before. But you're gonna see from this little clip what happened before. So middle and a high school, and Jennifer. Mississippi to Katrina's strongest winds and highest storm surge. And officials describe the scene as complete devastation. The Pass Christian School District in Pass Christian, Mississippi. In 2005, the leadership team was focused on trying to overcome the difficulties that all high poverty districts face. Our district was working very hard with regard to making growth. We were fortunate to have visionary leaders um, at the helm of our district, and we were just really all working hard for student success. Um, felt like we were moving in that direction. And then something really pivotal occurred. Hurricane Katrina, landfall, August 2005, changed everything of the life in which we knew. We've been through hurricanes with Camille, but. This was uh, far above anything we've ever had. Every school, every church, and every public building was either totally destroyed or unusable. We were close to annihilation you could get. It was uh, almost wiped us off the map. We date everything by pre or post Katrina times. Uh, it was such a significant event in all of our lives. It was as if a bomb had gone off through the whole city. 80, 90 percent of our town was gone. 85 percent of our staff lost their homes. 80 something percent of students lost their homes. They, you know, we heard tales of students spending nights um, on roofs cleaning, waiting for someone to rescue them. We had tears. It was a hard time for a lot of kids. Some of these kids lost everything. Some of them were very bitter and angry. Some were just very sad. It was a moment of truth for the school district, and they chose to meet the challenges brought about by Katrina head on. There were also many blessings within. One of those was critically realized just the importance of returning to school as soon as possible. So many uh, people in our community had lost everything that they had, and it was important that they had that um, sense of normalcy with regard to returning to school. 
we all came together in a way that had not ever happened before in our district. And during that time, some remarkable things happened with regard to team building, becoming unified in our mission, in our goals for student success. Our parents felt that same sense of support as a system rather than individual buildings. It's either the maximum value or the minimal value. It was an opportunity to rededicate themselves to meeting the needs of every student in the school district. The past Christian students deal with adversity on a daily basis. More than 60% of students come from low-income families and receive free and reduced lunch. And the district is still recovering from losing nearly 85% of all homes and businesses in Hurricane Katrina. But school leaders have worked diligently to keep these hardships from impacting student achievement. The schools are showing significant results. Both have been awarded National Blue Ribbon Awards from the U.S. Department of Education for overall academic excellence and test scores are way above average for the state. On the Algebra 1 Park exam, the school had better than 50% proficiency versus the state average of 27%. On the English 2 Park exam, they were 70% proficient versus the state average of 49%. We are number one in the state for academics on our end of the year test. The teachers, they teach us really well and we comprehend what we need to know and we show that on our tests, and we do really good. The school district developed a belief statement to help guide all of the work they do. Curriculum is challenging and progressive. Everyone is actively engaged in the learning process. All have an equal opportunity to learn. Learning is a shared responsibility. All are held to clearly defined high expectations. All are accepted, valued, and safe. As I looked at, and we've looked at your district's vision and goal statements, real similar, real similar to what's happening here. The, the goal and vision statements are great. They often include the word all, meaning we're about all of our kids. And that's really important. Didn't used to be that way in our country in the past. But today, most vision, goal, objectives, all that that come from public school districts talk about all kids which means all of us have a, have a responsibility to think about every one of our kids, particularly those that, that are disadvantaged or those kids that come with less and certainly those that, that perform less better in our school. What do we need to do to improve that? So at this point, I'd like to ask someone, a lot of you probably elementary teachers, but some of you secondary teachers as well, will will occasionally read to your kids aloud. Is there someone here that likes to read aloud to their kids? Okay, Tammy's gonna pick one of you. Keep your hands up. Now there, there went the hands. Tammy, there were a whole bunch out there. But... Is that all the way in the back? I hope they have, they have their reading glasses as well if they're clear back there. Okay. So we're going to ask you to read this paragraph to the group, if you would. Thank you. What's your name? Okay. Can you be a big teacher voice and do it without a mic? All right. Would you read this for us, Lori? There's a little more. Sorry about that, Lori. You noticed that you made the, the print smaller. <laughs> if your answer is more than one, then I submit that you have reasons of your own for preferring to believe that basic pupil performance derives from family background instead of school response to family background. We can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. Ah, uh, that's too small. Too small, that's Ron Edmonds. It says Ron Edmonds, Educational Leadership, 1979. That was the Journal of Educational Leadership. But the point here is 1979. Thank you, Lori, is that your name? Thank you. 1979, how many years ago was that? Okay, who said 38? 
Where are they? Somebody said 38. I saw that. Now they're either a math teacher or they were born in 1979. So, or both, or their child was born in 1979. One of, one of the three, there's probably a couple others in there as well. 38 years ago, Ron Edmonds had seen enough schools to write these words. And these words, we'd really like you to, to think about, to take with you, to carry with you, particularly this part here. School response to family background. That is what happens in high-performing, high-poverty schools. Despite what the circumstances are of the youngster when they cross the threshold, the adolescent, whoever of the school, whatever, whatever's coming with them, the educators in high-poverty, high-performing schools respond to the needs of that individual child. And that becomes the essence, the basic essence of what happens in these schools. So if you've got 30% of your kids that aren't where they need to be, and you know that a whole lot of them qualify for free and reduced meals, that kind of sets up the equations of, so what do we need to do? Today, we know what works. We know more about teaching and learning today than we ever have known in the history of our practice. We know more about how to get kids to proficiency, how to get kids graduated, well-equipped, all of that. We know more than we have. If one school can indeed overcome the pervasive effects of poverty on student achievement, shouldn't any school be able to do the same? That's the, that's the $64,000 question. And that's the question that we often hear discussed in the schools that have embarked on a journey to significantly improve. They've made a decision as colleagues in a school, we're going to do it. And as they progress and as they change practice and as they suddenly see more and more of their kids succeeding, this question always comes up. If it can happen across the street over there, why can't it happen here? What would we need to do? What's getting in our way? Whose interests are we choosing to serve? Those are tough questions. Those are difficult questions. And we're gonna talk about how those get handled in a moment or two. Well, what we have in our society and our schools is what we characterize as a knowing doing gap. Meaning we often know what works and what we need to do. But there's a gap between knowing what needs to be done and getting it done. We're going to ask you to watch another video here. We're going to transport you out of the United States to another place, a quite different video. You're not going to see a school in this video. You're not going to see a high-performing school, but you're going to see an example of, of knowing what needs to happen. I want you to watch this, and we'll talk about it in a moment. Oops. I 
मिलता है तुझ में तेरा है सारा तू ही तुझको पार लेगा तू ही है तेरा किनारा Oh. Uh-huh.